before I give this item, I got a message for that young lady, Jasmine. Jasmine, when you get to Avondale College, you ask for Sally Ann Dean, for Sally Ann Dean is our daughter. She's in charge of education. So we'll give you a welcome when you get over there. If you like what you hear and you really would like to learn, you could actually go to America to the Woodward College of Whistling and learn how to whistle. The only difference is that they will teach you to whistle with your vocal cords just as you talk with your vocal cords. I'm officially known as a puckerer because I use my lips. Ronnie Rinaldi uses his tongue and his teeth. And various whistlers around the world have various ways of whistling. Now this one here that is the, in the monastery garden and the um, visual um, stuff that you'll see on the screen was made by a friend of mine who toured the world taking photographs of gardens. So this piece is called In a Monastery Garden, and if I don't put some gel on my lips, the humidity is very low this morning. When I did uh, Bells Across the Meadow in Sabbath School, with my last few notes, they was, just weren't there.
I started whistling when I was only six years old, and uh, that's just over 80 years ago. So, my, That is my wife's favourite, by the way, in the monastery garden. Now we have the children's story, if the children would like to come up, and I just would like them to come and help me to tell this story. In fact, I might even need some of the grown-ups to help because I don't know whether the children can read all of this, but I believe it's been recorded, so if I sit down there, they won't hear this, will they? Yep. Use this one? Can you still record, see it if I sit down? Oh, I might not get up. <laughs> now, this story happened so long ago that it was even before I was born. And they didn't have fire engines in those days. It's about a fire. Where if we had a fire engine, we probably wouldn't have the story. But the fire engine in those days was pulled by horses. And this was a three-story house. It's, you know, three levels. And it caught on fire. Now, oh, this is where you come in. I want you to help tell me when somebody woke up in the bottom floor of this building, they called out... I don't think that would wake anybody up. Come on, now. You've got to wake those people up that are asleep. One, two, three. Fire, fire, fire. Oh, that's good. Yes, that would wake people up. And so this building caught fire. Help me. Not yet, not yet. And as the building caught on fire... The people saw that in the window of the top story sat a little boy and he had his jacket pulled up over his head and he cried out. Help me. Good. That's what he did. He cried out, help me. Now, when he cried out, nobody was game enough to go and help him. But from the back of the crowd a man came forth and he took off his jackets and he started to climb up a down pipe, you know, a drain pipe that takes all the water off the roof. And the people said, who is this man? That's right. And the man climbed up and he got level with the boy and he reached out to the boy and he says, I've gone as far as I can go. I want you to remember that because it's very important that we're going to hear about another man that went as far as he could go too. And the man said, jump. And the little boy shook his head. He didn't talk. He just shook his head, meaning no, he couldn't jump. And then all of a sudden there was a big bang and the roof fell in. And the boy got such a fright, he jumped. And the man caught him and <laughs> said, now you hang on tight. And the, he said, we've got to go down through all that smoke. We've got to go down through all those flames. So you better keep that jacket of yours over your head. And so the little boy buried his face into the back of the man and the man started climbing down the um, down pipe. And the pipe was so hot that it, just before he got to the bottom, he had to let go and the man and the boy fell down and everybody Clap. clapped. Yes, they clapped because they were so pleased that they managed to get down. Now, the, by that time, the mayor had arrived, and he says, well, why was that little boy still up there? Why didn't someone get him down? And they said, oh, his grandmother, when she heard that the place was on fire, she had a heart attack and died, and the little boy wouldn't leave her. And that's why he was still sitting up there. And the mayor said, oh, well, I'll take him home tonight, and in the morning we'll have a town meeting, and we'll decide who's going to take the little boy home to, to look after him. All you other people can sleep in the school hall, and we'll find out tomorrow morning, because this happened right late at night, what's going to happen the next day. So the next day, the school teacher says, 
she put up her hand. She says, I'm too old to get married and have children, but I'd like to adopt that little boy and I'd give him a good education. I'd be able to help him with his homework. I'd like to adopt him. And then another man says, well, I've got a little boy at home. He's about the same age as this boy. I, we would, my wife and I'd like to adopt him. He'd be a good playmate for our little boy. And then the man that owned the local mine, he was very rich. He stepped forward and he says, well, my wife and I, we can't have children, but we would like to adopt him. I've got plenty of money. I'll see he gets the best education. He'll have everything he wants in life. And then somebody at the back of the hall said, let the boy choose. And the mayor said, no, that's a good idea. Okay, Sonny, who do you want to go home and live with? And with that, somebody came down from the behind. And the people said, who is, who is that man? And this man came forward. He had bandages around his feet. He had bandages around his hand. And he came right down the front of the hall. And he stood there with his hands outstretched and the bandages there. And he said one word to the little boy. Come. And the little boy looked up into the eyes of his Savior and rushed him, grabbed that man around his legs and hugged him. And that man took the little boy home and looked after him. Now, you've got to remember this story because at the end of the sermon, you'll hear a little bit more. Good, thanks for listening. As you've already heard, we've Father in heaven, this morning as we kneel before you, Lord, we have no doubt who our Savior is. Lord, as we recognize through our lesson and through the end time events we're seeing every day on our televisions and hearing on our radios, Lord, the, the time is short, Father. An end is coming swiftly, Father, and we need to be prepared. We need to be close to you. We need to be in contact with you every day, Lord. We need to understand, Father, prophecy and the foretelling of the future, Lord, which is closing in on us so quickly. And Lord, this morning we bow before you as your people. We confess our sin, Lord. We ask for forgiveness. We ask, Lord, what you will do with our lives, what you will have us do for you. We recognize, Lord, the ultimate need in every part of our life, Lord, not just here today, but in our work lives, in our personal lives, Lord, in any problems we have, illnesses, Lord, we depend on you for all of it. This morning, Father, we would ask, Lord, as we pray at one o'clock for, for our friend John, Lord, that you will also draw close, you'll hear our prayers, Lord, and you will lean forward to your, your son, John. We ask, Lord, that you'll bless our parents, you'll bless our siblings, you'll bless our children, Father. And as each one of us contemplates, Lord, where we are in our relationship with you this morning, Lord, we'd ask that you would Lean into us, Father, and you would hear our need for you, Lord, this morning. That you'll forgive our sins, Lord, and that you will rectify things within us, Lord, that need to be changed. I'd ask, Lord, that you'll remember those who couldn't make it here this morning, for whatever reason that may be, for discouragement, Lord. Whatever it is, Lord, and you'll give them this blessing of the Sabbath, Father. The thankfulness we feel for you, Lord, for this day when we draw aside, when we forget our cares and our worries, Lord, and we meet with you in your house. We pray that you'll bless Athel this morning as, you, as he brings us your word, Lord, that we'll listen, we'll be attentive, we'll hear, and we'll understand. Lord, this morning we have a full church, and each of us, as we bow before you, recognize, Lord, where we are in this world's history, 
And each of us, Lord, reaches out to you this morning for that connection, Lord. No matter where we've been, what we've done, where we are in our lives, Lord, that connection is promised to us today as we are. So bless us this morning, Father, I pray. Forgive us. Help us to remember you as we go into this coming week, Lord. Help us to rely on you every day for our, to have our needs met, Lord, and for communication with you. We ask in your name. Amen. As you've already noticed, uh, the format's a little bit different. This sermon's going to be part sermon, part seminar, and you've already had part of the story. In 1982, I became a registered grief counsellor. And if any of you get touched by what I say and you want to cry, you've got my blessing. It won't affect me. It might affect somebody sitting close to you. And I hope that you will be attentive so that when you leave this sermon today, you will be a better person to help others who grieve. There's so many misconceptions about what you should and should not do when you help somebody for grieving and what you should and should not say. So I hope I correct them. I hope you'll remember them. More so, I hope that you will put them into practice and help someone else who's grieving. Because when we lost our daughter after 11 and a half weeks, everybody said the wrong thing. I now know what they should have said. Grief. Where did it start? Should we grieve? How we, can we help? How can we handle it? And can we help others who are grieving? Well, we go back to Revelation 12, 7, and there was war in heaven. Surely our Heavenly Father grieved that a place so perfect, the war had to break out in it. And in Revelation 12, 9, Satan and his angels were cast out. You go back to the beginning of Scripture, in Genesis 1, 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, that being so, the Godhead must have grieved for the loss of the bad angels and their leader. Imagine you're a good angel and you're buddy up with another angel and you suddenly realize that that angel is now a bad angel and that angel that your, was your friend is now going to be cast out of heaven. Bad enough to lose a buddy or a friend in this life. In Genesis 6, 6, and it repented the Lord that he'd made man on earth and it grieved him in his heart. For God the Father does grieve. Ephesians 4, 13, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit can grieve. Mark 3, 5, and when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, Shortest verse in scripture, isn't it? Jesus wept. So we know that the Trinity, they can all grieve. So if it's all right for them to grieve, surely it must be all right for us. But later on we will hear where Paul says, don't grieve. Sounds like a contradiction. It's not. Two of the, um, oh, yeah, and in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. It is very easy, if you're used to it like I am, to sit quiet for over two hours while a woman cries nonstop. And all I did was to feed the tissues. I used to be embarrassed. I'm no longer embarrassed when a lady cries. Like most of our body's functions, what takes place 
is a chemical reaction. When frightened, adrenaline is manufactured. When you digest food, hydrochloric acid is manufactured. When you go to sleep at night, during the day, your body has manufactured melatonin, and when you lay down, that melatonin is turned into serotonin. And you can actually go and buy melatonin capsules at the pharmacy to help you sleep. The same in grief. When you grieve, a chemical reaction takes place. You men, of roughly my age, would realise that years ago you were told, big boys don't cry. What a tragedy that was. Well, they should, because if a male is left in a state of grief long enough, he, and he doesn't cry, he will kill himself. The reason that he will kill himself is that all these manganese and protein, which is manufactured up to 30 times more than presently in your eyes, ladies are given permission to cry and get rid of it. Big boys don't cry. And that's turned into a whole range of toxins, and the man will kill himself with a disease called myothenia gravis. It's like muscular atrophy, he will just waste away. We had one case of a man who went to a doctor and the doctor gave every test he could think of to him and he came back and said, they're all negative. I don't know what's wrong with you. Oh, by the way, how's your wife? Oh, she died three months ago. Uh-huh. The doctor says, and did you grieve? No, he says, big boys don't cry. And the doctor says, I think you need to have a a service, a ceremonial service, and Australia and New Zealand have one every day, every year. Anzac Day gives me, big boys permission to cry. It can also cause things like colitis, fibrositis, headaches, phantom pains, and all sorts of physical ailments like that, just because you men don't cry. Now, it doesn't only happen to men. It happens to women, too. I had one woman, actually, she was the one I fed the tissues to for over two hours. When she stopped, I said, you don't have a headache now, do you? And it was as if I'd hit her. She says, no, I don't. How do you know that? I said, because whatever reason you came to see me about, you didn't cry. Oh, she says, no, I didn't. She said, my mother died and I didn't cry. My brother cried and I, di I didn't cry. And my son, his de facto, just had a stillborn child and I didn't cry. And I said, well, that's why you had that headache all the time. She said, it's gone. I said, yes, you got rid of the manganese and protein. We are made to cry. Do you know you're the only creatures on this planet that God gave two nerves from the eye to the brain? Don't you tell me that your pet dog, when you take the pups away, cries. It cannot cry. It's only got one nerve from the eye to the brain. You've got two. Aren't we fearfully and wonderfully made? We've been made to cry. We've been made to grieve. God was good to us. We can surely say as a statement of praise, as in Psalms 139.14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and my soul knoweth right well. Okay, now, how do you handle grief? It comes in a great many ways, mostly unexpected, and your way of coping is not mine. Unless you're breaking the law of God and breaking the law of the land, every way you grieve is correct for you. If you want to go out like a lady I know whose husband was killed in the hottest street massacre in Melbourne years ago, she goes out at midnight and swims in the Mentone Beach, wherever that is, just off Melbourne somewhere, and while she's swimming, she cries her heart out. And on a sunny day, she goes to the cemetery and lays on that warm tombstone and says, I feel the warmth of my husband's body. 
I wouldn't do it. I don't think you would do it. That's her way of grieving, and there's nothing wrong. It's you're not breaking the law of God. It's you're not breaking the law of man. Now, I have a lot of people come to me. I'm a cancer survivor. I had cancer of the bladder and everything below the waist was taken away. And if you're someone who's going to have a friend that gets cancer, they will need a special friend, and it may be you. And when I had my cancer, I ended up writing this poem, and it may strike some chords with you. You are a special friend to me, a treasure to be sure. Alas, this illness is killing me, unless they find a cure. Just to let you know what our friendship has meant to me, I'm sending these lines so you can clearly see. I need your love and gift of kindness, so please spend some time with me. I wish to say sorry for my sickness and the times we often disagreed. You're so wonderful being a friend to me, ever ready to talk and spend your time for free. When you visit, my spirit receives such a lift that, my friend, it's a miracle, it really is a gift. You easily forget my every mistake, gently touching me when you think my heart may break. How long ago did you become a special friend to me? Yesterday, last month, last year? Seems an eternity. Many treasured memories are stored in my heart. They really are a comfort when we are both apart. You accept me in sunshine when skies are grey. You are glad that I am me, no matter what I say. Words are nowhere near adequate, it is true, to express our emotions or our point of view. Oh, how one wishes to get their point understood with words of such meaning that sound really good. Life appears so meaningless like a child's game. Your presence is important like the falling rain. Now, special friend of mine, when I'm not around, use your talents wisely on someone yet to be found. There are others needing a special friend just like you. Please do not hide yourself away, whatever you may do. Thanks for your time and all the help until the very end. Don't stop now from being to others a very special friend. My memories will cease as I take my very last breath and I end up beaten by the enemy of death. There are others who are badly needing a lift. Go, my special friend, and use your special gift. John 11:33 and verse 35, we read where Jesus groaned. In other words, he was angry. The SDA Bible co commentary on pages 114 and 115. No other emotion shown in grief comes forth as forceful in anger. Christ was angry, we're told. It can come in short bursts or last for hours. Sleep patterns change, as does eating habits. The worst of our nature takes over hurting all around us if we let it. Marriages can blow apart. Whole families become fractured. Well, because of anger, because we're so angry at somebody or something. It may be the doctor because he didn't get, a, get the cancer early enough. It may be that driver who didn't see where he was going and he was drunk. Maybe the state of the roads or the ambulance arriving late. We're angry at somebody or something and we want to get rid of it. And who do we take it out on? We take it out and the family would don't. Talk about your feelings if doing so brings forth tears. Cry away the pain, the tears of healing. Remember, you're made to cry. Talk about your loved ones. Use their name. They did exist. We had one case of a woman who, her husband had been a music teacher in a university. 
and they went to visit her after the husband had died. And she was, apparently was an upstairs um, house and she called down, go on inside, I'll be down shortly. And they went inside and the piano was there. And one of them started playing the piece of music and another one of the students says, don't play that. That, that was Fred's favourite piece of music. And the wife is halfway down the stairs. She says, keep playing. That's the first time anyone's used his name since he died. It was music to my ears. Get the point? Use their name. They did exist. Their loved ones will love to hear their name. If it brings forth tears, I'll give you a pat on the back. Denial's not just a river in Egypt, and we all go through life denying things. We deny how we feel. I meet people in the pharmacy, and the first thing is, oh, how are you doing, Ethel? And I say, oh, yeah, good, good. Well, why am I in the pharmacy if I'm doing good? <laughs> <laughs> This doesn't make sense. I'm denying the fact that I, I'm there because I'm a jolly crook. If you feel angry, tell someone and why you feel that way. To harbour your anger will mentally and physically harm you and drive a wedge between those you love. What does it say? Don't let the, anger, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Your brain's an amazing thing, not just for remembering how you get dressed or how you find your way around. Your brain's going to help you when someone dies that you love and you attend their funeral. Your brain's going to do a lot for you and you don't even know it. If you've done anything about grief counselling and you're here today, you may know what I'm about to say. Your brain will start manufacturing a drug called metaencephalin. The brain manufactures it, gets into the bloodstream, and as soon as it gets behind the eyes, the lacrimal glands will absorb that metaencephalin. And Mrs. Jones, who's 80 or 90 years old, and people say, wasn't she marvelous the way she handled her husband's funeral? She never ever broke down and went hysterical. Of course she didn't. The meta and Kevlin kicked in. The amount of emotional investment governs the grief response. In handling grief, we either cry it out or we talk it out. There's no other way. You cry it out or you talk it out. And if you're going to go to somebody who's lost a loved one, they tell you something. 10 times, 20 times, 80 times, 90 times, 100 times. You be prepared to go and listen to them and tell it to you for another 100 times as if you classed yourself as a friend. One day suddenly I think, oh, I've told you that before, haven't I? And you won't hear it again. In question four, can we help others who are grieving? Yes, if we know what to do or say or when to keep quiet. What a wonderful grief manual you got here in the Bible. Let's read the book of Job. How many days did his friends go and visit him? Seven days. And what did they say in seven days? Nothing. Your presence when you're going to visit somebody that's grieving is the greatest gift you can give them. You cannot say anything it's going to help much. But there is something you can now memorise. I'm going to give it to you. Six words. I'm sorry. I know you're hurting. And we all say it together. I'm sorry. I know you're hurting. Do not qualify it. If you haven't travelled in that man's moccasins, you don't know what the journey's like. You know they're hurting, you don't know how much, and you don't know why. It's not always because there's a loss of the person who's standing alongside the graveside either. They can be hurting for a variety of other reasons. If you must speak, ask do they have any questions or what's going on in their mind.
I'm going to put certain papers down here, which we haven't got time to read out. If you're really interested, maybe your pastor will be able to get you a, a copy of them. Now, if somebody asks you a question and you don't have the answer to, don't make up an answer. It'll come back and bite you. Here's some things if you must ask questions or you feel impelled that you have to do something to help them. You can say to them, you must have lots of things that are going on in your mind at the moment. And if they want to talk, let them talk. If they want to cry, let them cry. What is giving you the most trouble now? What do you think about most? What do you miss the most? Is it their company? Is it their chatter? Is it their advice? If you're a man, is it the perfume? Is it the gentle touch? Is it the kiss goodnight? Do you think about talking about the way you feel would make someone else feel bad? Are you sleeping at night? Are certain thoughts keeping you awake? Are you having difficulty concentrating during the day? What happens at those times? What happened to the day of the death? Boy, I could talk for two, three hours about experiences of what's happened at the day of the death with people that come to see me. Do you want to talk about it now? How would you describe your relationship with your oldest son, father, wife, lover, etc.? I don't reckon anyone has hurt as much as I'm hurting. I hear it all the time. And the other things that I hear is, if only. If only we had never had that argument. If only I hadn't spoken so angrily. We can't change the past. Remember, the amount of emotional investment governs the grief response. If the marriage is on a down and downer and that one of the partners die, you may see no response at all at the funeral. But if it was on the up and up, you may very well see a lot of tears. People Appreciate a touch. Even of the opposite sex, it is quite appropriate to touch between the shoulder blade and the fingertips no longer than three seconds, or you may send the wrong message. Touch. How many times in Scripture do we read where Jesus reached out and touched? And in most of those cases, he reached out and touched because they were hurting. How much does Jesus invest in the world? Nothing can come as close to his emotional investment. His grief was both physical and mental in the extreme. God the Father was also grieving watch his only begotten son suffer and not being guilty of a sin of any sort, but only guilty of ours. One bright spot in all the horror of Christ dying on the cross. If we read in Luke 23, 41 to 43, when one of those men turned to Christ and says, remember me, how sweet would that be to Jesus? Be asked to remember. Do not try to answer questions as why me or do you think God is punishing me? You don't know. I don't believe personally that God does punish us now. That comes later. If the grieving person believes differently from us, then let them hold on to their belief system. 
They have enough to cope with on the day of the funeral without you telling them their loved one's not up there looking down, they're in the grave. And you hear it on the news all the time, don't you? Yes, when someone dies, they always go up. No one ever goes down deeper. Grieving is a natural process. You can always say to somebody, if they ask you a question, just say, I'm sorry, I don't know. Don't be afraid to cause tears. When in doubt, say nothing. Be like Job's friends for this seven days. Don't isolate, communicate with them. On the day of the funeral or the few days after, that telephone goes and someone rings and says, I'm sorry, or someone comes over with an apple pie or comes around with a bunch of flowers, six weeks down the track, what we call the grief storm, six weeks, the person picks up the phone. Is it still working? They've had a feast of well wishes. Now the famine set in and nobody cares. That's when you need to go visiting, six weeks after. The most crucial time. That's when people will commit suicide. I visited one man. I've only visited two people without being asked. One was a pastor and one was this man. I just felt impressed he needed someone. Weeks later, he came to me and he said, Ethel, if you hadn't come and see me that afternoon, I wouldn't be here. I was going to do something drastic. And he just broke into tears and walked away. It was six weeks after he'd lost his wife. If I oh yeah, we've covered that. The if onlys and the might have beens that people say to me, and they may also say to you, what's going to be yours response? Here's one. I've used it that many times and it seems to work well, people accept it. If Jesus, the Son of God, was not able to change the past when Lazarus died, do you think any of us can do that and change the past? Jesus made the situation all right again, but it did not change the fact Lazarus did die. And you'll get that from people they want to go back and change the past. You can't. Have you ever been in a situation where you have felt alone and your heart could break? You think nobody loves you? Like the little boy in the story, sitting there in the front seat of that hall, he'd lost the only person he knew ever loved him. He had no relatives. And he's sitting there crying, sobbing his heart out. And he hears one word from the Saviour. He says, come. And the boy rushes in to the arms of his Saviour. He feels the love that he was a man prepared to go through fire and get his hands all burnt in an attempt to save him. And he rushes and hugs him and says, come. Jesus says the same to us today. He says, come. And where's Jesus going to take us? He's going to take us to the holy city. And oh, what a joy it will be. We'll be walking on streets of gold. We'll be seeing buildings built out of precious stones. God has already by that time dried the tears from my eyes, if I can make it. And only by the grace of Jesus will I make it. And we'll be in the holy city. The holy city.
if any of you have any questions, I'm quite happy after benediction out in the foyer to answer them.
ashes that stand for benediction. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, how we look for that day when you come and you will wipe the tears from every eye. There will be no more sorrow, death, dying, or sickness. And we'll be taken home to that heavenly city. May what we've heard today, may we put into practice when we meet somebody who's hurting. May we show some of the compassion that Jesus showed. May we be a better example of him. Help us to this end, we pray in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. <laughs>